tonight. Uh, of course, we're talking about the Senkaku paradox and the question of whether that results in major war uh, flowing from minor interests. Uh, it's always a pleasure uh, to welcome Michael O'Hanlon. Um, he's notable. He's well known as one of the nation's foremost authorities on national security matters and military strategy. He's a, he's a senior fellow and in charge of research in the foreign policy area at the Brookings Institution. Uh, he's uh, the author of more books than I can account for, approaching 20 some, I think. They're on a range of subjects, most of them national security focused, but also specifically on the Middle East at times, on China with colleagues, and in a total sense, a commentary on the Obama administration's foreign policy. Um, tonight may seem subtle to you at first, but it's, it's not, and it has many applications, and I'm looking forward very much to, to hearing uh, uh, his, his view on that particular uh, paradox. Um, Michael is uh, a product of Princeton University. His bachelor's degree, his master's degree in uh, the physical sciences, and uh, some strange group of Princeton graduates tried to refute Einstein's theory of relativity, <laughs> of, of which Michael was one. The, I don't know if anybody's mentioned that in introducing it before, but I'm amused by it. It, it suggests a certain uh, quickness of mind and, and seriousness about challenges, which is probably close to him. I'm sorry that the Orioles game is almost over now. When Michael was here a couple of years ago, after he spoke here, he did go over to Orioles Park to catch the last few innings of the, the ball game. So as well as, uh, and he, he tried to tell me earlier that he's now running to work, which is seven miles, but he doesn't think about anything on the way. I, I can't believe it. <laughs> I mean, he produces so much in an interesting way that I imagine his mind to be constantly at work, you see. And so it's a contradiction for him to try to convince me that he's, uh, he's not thinking on the, on the way to work. But in any case, uh, he's... Uh, one of our nation's most interesting scholars. He's, uh, he's probably been on the, the radio, on television 4,000 times since the, uh, 1991. He's uh, certainly written op-eds in the major news journals. He's published in all the major journals of the country. And as I've said, he's written on a wide variety of subjects primarily in the national security area. It's always an enormous pleasure because we can all look forward to a marvelous evening to present uh, Dr. Michael O'Hanlon. Uh, thank you for coming to a talk about the Senkaku Paradox. When I'm guessing, knowing, knowing the IQ in Baltimore, most of you know what that is, but some of you may not, and you came anyway. And so let me now explain because you sort of really shouldn't know what the Senkaku Islands are because they're unimportant. They are in the Western Pacific Ocean. They're uninhabited. There are about eight of them, although it gets into that definition of what's a rock and what's an island because they're all about the same size as a rock. Uh, it wouldn't quite qualify for Gilligan's Island. It's sort of a little step below that. I've got a picture of one on the cover of my book that I'm uh, happily um, trying to sell outside afterwards, and a couple of you already were kind enough to grab a copy. But the notion here is a more general problem of how do we deal with situations where an adversary, even Russia, uh, along the lines of Angela Stent's book, or China, might attack one of our allies, but not head on, not going to London or Tokyo, but trying to whittle away or nibble away at a smaller piece of territory. And you might ask, well, why would they even do that? And I think in this world, when we're talking about Russia and China rising and returning and becoming threats to us again, we often don't think about the plausible paths to war. Because I really don't think in a world where all three of those countries, the United States, China, Russia, all have nuclear weapons, I don't see any one of them attacking the heartland of another one or any close ally. It just doesn't 
strike me as anything a sane person would do. But there could be places where an attack might look a little more manageable in terms of the risk. And that's where the Senkaku paradox comes into play, and I'll explain a bit more by that phrase and what I mean by it in just a second. But the reason I think this is a credible path to war, and much more than the all-out attack on an ally's capital or main territory, is because China or Russia could have a devious purpose in considering this kind of an aggression. It wouldn't be because they care about the Senkaku Islands per se, or about a town in eastern Estonia. I've also got scenarios about a Russian attack not to take an entire Baltic state, which are now, of course, in NATO, and therefore we're sworn to defend as we celebrate the 70th anniversary of that great alliance. But what if they just nibble away? What if Vladimir Putin one day uh, decides to send his little green men to a small dairy farm town in eastern Estonia where 60% of the 200 people who live there are Russian speakers? And he's already articulated a doctrine that gives him the right in his mind to do that, to defend Russian speakers anywhere. And he still thinks the Baltics should probably be in a Russian sphere of influence, whether they should be still in a Soviet Union. I don't know if he's on record uh, having an opinion on that, but he is on record saying that Russian speakers everywhere are sort of his prerogative to worry about and to defend. And most of the Russian speakers in Estonia and Latvia are very happy to live in Estonia or Latvia <laughs> rather than Russia, but Putin doesn't care. In fact, I think he cares so little that I could even imagine a scenario where he deliberately uses a Russian intelligence operative uh, agency and you know, uh, uh, FSU or what have you to go in and do an assassination of a Russian speaker and then frame the Estonian or Latvian majority, or you know, the uh, part of the population speaking those languages that is not Russian by any kind of uh, linguistic or cultural or historic affiliation, but bl frame them, blame them, and then use that aggression as a pretext to bring in his little green men and control the town, you know, to calm things down until order is restored. He promises he won't stay that long. He promises that he has no other intentions besides just stepping over the border a few kilometers. And how could we object? But of course, the minute this happens, NATO is now in existential crisis because half of NATO is going to want to go expel the Russians militarily, and the other half is going to say it's really not worth it. Swinging back to the Senkaku Islands, which the Chinese call the Diyu. I think some of you know very well the predicament we're in with these islands. But let me just explain sort of the absurdity of it. I think it's a little bit absurd, and it could be tragically absurd. For a long time, as the Japanese were on their imperialistic streak, they controlled, of course, Taiwan and other major island areas in the Western Pacific, largely from the end of the 19th century until the end of World War II. After that was over, we liberated that region, and we restored Taiwan to China, which was, of course, in a civil war, and ultimately uh, that war was settled in favor of the communists in 1949, and the nationalists retreated to Taiwan. And we did other things. We, we uh, certainly took back our own territories that might have been contested. We, we made sure we tried to settle scores properly, but we did not really know what to do with these eight uninhabited islands called the Senkakus or the Diyus. And so we sort of rolled the dice and we gave them back to Japanese administration, but we did not establish a US government position on whose we rightfully thought they were. And we still don't have an, an opinion or a position in the US government on whether they should be China's, Taiwan's, Japan's, or nobody's. Nobody lives there. Nobody does anything there. They don't even have Boy Scout and Girl Scout ecology trips there for overnight camping. <laughs> There is some fishing in the waters, and so if you want to get into a law of the sea discussion about whether these tiny islands qualify to have an economic zone, that's the only way in which the islands could be said to have any importance. But the real importance for China and Japan is they are a, a vestige of previous rivalries and wars. And therefore, for a China that's now rising and feels like it maybe is payback time a little bit, uh, this is a contested space. So the United States government is in the very strange position of having no position on whose islands these are, even though we sort of made the decision at the end of World War II about who would control them, 
And now we are sworn to defend them as if they were one of the four main islands of Japan. Because as President Obama publicly articulated uh, about a half dozen years ago, and I think he was right to do this, because you don't want to let deterrence stay in a gray zone where people doubt whether you're committed or not. President Obama said the U.S.-Japan Treaty applies to the Senkaku Islands. He felt the need to say that because the Chinese were sending Coast Guard ships and fishing ships and all sorts, and aircraft to harass, to contest, not to land on the island or any of the islands, but simply to send a message that maybe uh, worse things are coming. And so President Obama made this argument that if those islands were attacked, the United States would respond. Then about 2014, I think, maybe a year or two after uh, the president had said that, my good friend and a great Marine with whom I'm having lunch tomorrow, re now retired Lieutenant General John Whistler, was the head of the third Marine Expeditionary Force based in Okinawa. And therefore, he was the most senior Marine in the Western Pacific. And he went to Japan, and he was doing a press conference. He was asked at that press conference, if China takes one of the Senkaku Islands, what should the United States do in response? And General Whistler said the only thing that I believe he could have, he said, take it back. And then he continued, actually, maybe there are some ways to get China off without physically taking it back or landing our own Marines ashore. So in one paragraph, he basically first says, let's do another Marine amphibious invasion of an island with China as the enemy on a piece of land that's about a square mile where there's no economic activity and we don't even have a US government view as to whose island it should be. And then in the next breath, basically saying, maybe we should bomb the Chinese position and just kill the soldiers so we don't have to land. Or maybe he meant a blockade and a blockade may sound like the most natural military compromise. I think it might be the thing we would actually do if I had to put money on it, but I'm not sure that's much safer because as you know, a blockade is seen as a, an act of war and also are the Chinese really going to accept the blockade or are they gonna try to contest it and what happens when they contest it? So I thought General Whistler said the only things he could have in that situation, but I read his comments and I said, this is bad because this really could happen. And the only position we've, the only idea we've really thought through about how to respond is General Whistler's idea. He's been clear, he's been specific. I'm glad the Chinese heard him because they should have a little bit of the fear of God that maybe we would just take them back or bomb the Chinese positions. I don't wanna take away that option, at least in rhetorical and doctrinal and official terms, but I don't think that's the right response if this scenario plays out. Nor do I think we want to mount Operation Desert Storm 2 to take back that notional farming town in eastern Estonia if Vladimir Putin sends in little green men to control a town of 200 people. It would be such overwhelming effort, we would literally destroy the village to save it and risk nuclear war at the same time. So these scenarios began to haunt me <laughs> because I was hearing people in Washington talk about China's rise and Russia's return and we were watching their assertive behavior from the South China Sea in the case of China to Ukraine and Georgia and Syria in the case of Russia, and Russia also buzzing NATO aircraft all over the place in the North Sea and the Black Sea. And I didn't really know what scenario this could lead to militarily, but I thought these types of scenarios were the most credible. Vladimir Putin, by the way, again, it's called the Senkaku Paradox. And the paradox is if we follow through on our alliance commitment in the literal sense of the word, we wind up in the absurd, the absurd position of risking nuclear war to liberate a town of 200 people or a rock where no one lives. So the paradox is, I think, you know, the absurdity of that logical sequence. And yet, it would be equally unacceptable to ignore the aggression. Because what happens next? What kind, I'm not gonna conjure up images of the 1930s on you or suggest this would be the equivalent of you know, Hitler's initial forays into uh, you know, uh, uh, Central Europe and Austria and Czechoslovakia and whatnot and how that foreshadowed his invasions of France and Poland. But, but I do think we all know that you can't really appease aggression and expect it to stop there. And moreover, at what point did these alliance commitments start to seem meaningless? if we start to have a two-tier alliance where certain countries and certain pieces of territory matter to us less than others. So it's unacceptable to risk nuclear war to liberate a Senkaku Island 
or a Russian majority speaking town in eastern Estonia. But it's also unacceptable to ignore the aggression. So we're, I could have called it the catch-22. Uh, and so I thought we needed to spend more time thinking through possible solutions. That was the first part of the argument, first part of the project. The second big part was then to put on my military planners and modelers hat and try to think about what would happen if we did try to take back a Senkaku Island, but then China resisted or escalated. If we did try to take back that town in eastern Estonia, but then Russia resists or escalates, and how would these scenarios play out? And I think, you know, military modeling is a pretty imperfect science, and you've always got to have some pretty wide boundaries or parameters or, you know, uh, limits on either side, high and low, optimistic, pessimistic, to what you think might happen. It's pretty hard to foresee the outcome of war. But nonetheless, I think the odds are good that if the wars stayed conventional, we would prevail against Russia eventually. We would not prevail against Russia initially because geography is incredibly against us in regard to the Baltic states. With China, we might be able to uh, blockade their position on one of these islands, or we might still be able to win a naval confrontation at sea, but it's getting harder and harder as they modernize their submarine force, their precision strike missile force, develop their hypersonic weapons, make our airfields vulnerable, make our big ships vulnerable. And so I don't know where this scenario plays out, but most of all, the risk of a all-out conventional war with nuclear potential for whichever side is losing and decides they might want to threaten escalation seems completely inconsistent with the stakes, which are so small, at least in geographic terms. So what do we do about that conundrum? Well, anyway, so I tried to work through the military math. And to me, the math looks difficult and getting harder all the time, not because we're falling behind China and Russia. I think that sometimes in the Washington defense circles, we, we talk about how China and Russia are rising and catching up a little bit too pessimistically. I mean, yes, they're making progress. And yes, we need to redouble our efforts in certain areas of technology. But you know, we've still got a $700 billion a year military budget. China's around 200 billion, Russia's around 50. And we have the most prosperous allies in the world, even if the current White House spends a lot more time berating and belittling them than celebrating these alliances. Um, and Donald Trump is right at one level. They don't do enough as a group. But they happen to be, you know, if you look at the list of the 20 wealthiest countries on the planet, about 16 are American allies. And if you add up their GDPs and their military budgets, and then you look at the whole list of 60 American allies or close security partners like Israel, we wind up still in the, in the Western alliance system accounting for two thirds of world GDP and two thirds of world military spending. This has never been seen before in the history of the planet. Even in the Cold War, it wasn't this good. And all the uh, international relations literature that I read in graduate school in the 1980s talked about balances of power and how countries and blocs tended to not want one group to be the super powerful single unipolar element in the international system. But in fact, that's what's happened. And so we do see a preponderance of military resources and spending still in the Western alliance system. So I'm not here to preach American demise or decline. But the technologies are advancing in such a way that increasingly people can reach out and touch somebody from a long ways away, even if they are not the preeminent military power on Earth. Precision strike and targeting are getting easier. And we can try to counter that by jamming people's satellites and by otherwise interfering with their communications. And some of that would work in war, uh, especially as we got into a conflict and we knew that we were engaged in something serious. Uh, but if we are bringing a lot of force right into the wheelhouse of Russia or China, to the Baltic states, to the Senkaku region, we're giving them a lot of geographic advantages and we're telegraphing our military moves. So the idea of direct liberation of one of these assets strikes me as suboptimal on a number of fronts. It's extremely risky. It plays to Russia and China strengths, plays to the playing field, the geography where they predominate, and should not be our first choice. So my military analysis and my technology analysis of how these trends are likely to intensify in the next 10 to 20 years reinforce the argument. These are not scenarios where we want to do what I think is the instinctive American thing, which is to go in with brute force and liberate whatever piece of land it might be. 
because that's sort of been the way we've thought about treaties for a long time, that every piece of territory covered by the treaty is equally important, and any aggression against any element thereof is therefore equally unacceptable. And at a certain strategic level, that may be true, but at a military level, I think we need to get a little bit more clever, a little bit more asymmetric, a little bit more indirect. And so that's where I'm gonna now do the third and final part of my presentation, and we can get into more detail on these scenarios as you wish in discussion, maybe trying to keep it relatively quick moving and short tonight. But um, what I wanna suggest is that, in fact, a military response with that 500,000 Desert Storm forces or uh, the multiple armadas of naval forces to the Senkaku region would not be the optimal response in most of these scenarios. So let me now take a few minutes to lay out what I think would be optimal. I'm not going for any secret uh, slideshow. I'm just grabbing my water. <laughs> By the way, you're also all very good to come out on opening day, Frank. That was a nice comment to tell people about my, my deep roots with um, Oriole Nation. but. Uh, I can't believe you came out to hear me instead of going to the game, so thank you. <laughs> uh, the military response that I think we should consider, or the overall response, does have a military element, but it's not in the first instance General Whistler's bombing campaign or amphibious assault. In the first instance, it would involve, let's stay with the Senkakus for a few minutes, it would involve out of the eight Senkaku islands, and let's say the Chinese have just taken two, First, we put U.S. and Japanese forces on the other six. So you try to limit the aggression. Now that you know the game China's playing, you make it much harder for them to continue. And I think that's a crucial element. You don't have to fire a shot to do that. You can even tell China what you're doing. You might want to get there first and then tell them you've gone, because part of this is you know, getting there and signaling and putting the onus on them to fire the first shot. Because this is partly, you know, this brings back images of and memories of Thomas Schelling and some of the other great nuclear theorists of the Cold War. Uh, these are the kinds of crises where, you know, it's almost like Putin moving into Crimea. You want to make your move and put the onus on the other guy to see if he really has the guts to contest what you've just done. So there are elements of Sun Tzu in this. You know, the greatest victory is without fighting. And so I think here, the, the most important element of the military response is to get to those other six Senkaku Islands quickly. So the Chinese can't do the same thing any further. Because again, remember, we don't really, I don't really care about those two Senkaku Islands. Sometimes my Japanese friends get in, insulted when I say that, and I know that historically it means something to them, but you know, not really. <laughs> they may say it means a lot to them uh, and bring off these you know, narratives of uh, Shinto uh, deities who are somehow honored there, but they, they really don't have strong attachments to the Senkaku Islands. Japanese have hardly ever done anything with them throughout their entire history. So I don't really mind taking the risk, even though all my Japanese friends are really kind and polite and don't expect a lot uh, in, in, in terms of uh, this kind of American response. Sometimes they uh, get a little bit visibly upset when I say that I really don't care about the Senkaku Islands, um, but I don't. But what I do care about is China seeing this as an opportunity to start slow and then expand and then continue. And then who knows at what point Okinawa is considered fair game or all the fishing banks that are presently in uncertain territory where China and Japan both have a claim. They haven't sorted out the claim, but if China is able to get away with taking back some Senkaku Islands, does it then feel it can get away with more? That's what I care about. And that's what I think American strategists have to care about in the first instance as well in general. So we don't want any more aggression. In addition to putting forces on the other six islands, I think we also need to surge our Navy, not to necessarily do anything per se, but to be present. Because our Navy still has more than twice the tonnage of the Chinese Navy. Unfortunately, our Navy also has about three times more places it operates than the Chinese Navy. If you consider the broader Middle East region, uh, the Baltic Sea, uh, some parts of the Mediterranean. And so I think we would need to, in this kind of a situation, bring more of the fraction of the Navy over to the Western Pacific. So there are elements of military response. I just don't see them as being the equivalent of starting a conflict. So that would be my first piece. And by the way, if things got uglier and the Chinese escalated, militarily or otherwise, then I think we would have to consider 
other kinds of military responses, which might be to blockade the, the Senkaku Island where the Chinese had taken roost, but it might also be to start firing non-lethal weaponry into the propellers of uh, oil ships coming out of the broader Persian Gulf headed for China. In other words, go after the economy, go after the jugular. This is getting harder with China's Belt and Road Initiative and China's overall naval expansion. But we certainly are far more powerful today in the broader Persian Gulf region than we are in the Western Pacific when you're matched up against China. And the Yankees and Orioles may not seem to care who's playing on the other's home field, because did the uh, Yankees just win? Yes. Yeah, that's a real shame. Um, yeah, I know, I shouldn't have gotten that, brought that up. Uh, now you're all, I, I've lost the audience. But, 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 I, but I am with you in sympathy. And um, in, in baseball, you can, you can win on the enemy's territory. And I do consider the Yankees an enemy as well. Uh, but but, but in, in, in war, we're much better off with an engagement in the per Persian Gulf region where we have multiple strong security partnerships and where the region is quite far from Russia so you're, and quite far from China. So you're not playing to anybody else's geographic advantage. For these countries that do not have a lot of long range power projection capability, they're pretty fierce when you fight them in their own neighborhoods. They're still not that good. Even China's not that good at projecting a lot of power hundreds or thousands of miles from its shores. And Russia sent 4,000 personnel to Syria, and that was fairly impressively done, but it was 4,000. Now, it was enough to turn the tide, but it was not enough that if they were ever headed against us in a serious way over something we really cared about, that they could actually compete. So if we do have military options in the back of our head, should things escalate, in the first instance, I would like them to involve really important, really economically important assets in the broader Persian Gulf with relatively few people at risk and in places where we have the competitive military advantage and where we can perhaps even think about using non-lethal weaponry in certain cases for certain kinds of actions. But the centerpiece of my proposed strategy is economic warfare. And I, I try to spend a chapter or a chapter and a half or so of the book developing a more systematic way of thinking about this. And um, I'm not an economist, so I don't claim that I nailed it. But there's been a lot of use of economic sanctions in the last 20 years. We're getting better at it. We usually have such ugly internal fights and so much anxiety over proper policy towards Iran or Russia or even North Korea that we forget how much better we've gotten at applying economic sanctions. And I think taking stock of these lessons and then looking at some overall trends in the global economy and recognizing where we have disproportionate opportunity to put pressure on somebody else and probably be resilient ourselves is the right way to think. And defense strategists don't usually think this way. Military people like me don't usually think this way. I'm not a military person per se, but I'm a military analyst. And historically, if you look at the way our military commands prepare for war, they do not closely integrate with Treasury, with uh, CFIUS, the Committee on Foreign Investment in the United States, with other parts of our government that are specialized in economics. They typically would feel that's going beyond their turf, that uh, you know, if, if the president wants them to support a sanction strategy, he'll tell them. And then the National Security Council will figure out a way to bring sanctions and military threats into an overall cohesive strategy. But we don't think about this stuff a lot in advance with the people who are really charged with war planning in the US government. Day to day, the war planners think about bombs and bullets. And day to day, the Treasury people think about sanctions, but almost in a separate category of problems. We've got to bring these teams together. Because if one of these scenarios plays out, there are a few things I would like to propose by way of a, of a response. And by the way, some of this we should do now, because some of it involves making ourselves more resilient. I'll give you an example. Something called the National Defense Stockpile of strategic minerals and metals. In the Cold War, we built that up, and it was worth 15 to $20 billion. Leave aside petroleum, which was a separate strategic reserve that we still do have. But the national defense stockpile was things like cobalt and zinc and titanium, and things that we didn't always have an adequate 
abundance here in the United States or in North America, although quite a bit of this stuff is in pretty good abundance in the Western Hemisphere. But we were worried that the Soviets of the time could impede us from accessing these kinds of sources in places like maybe Africa or certainly within the Soviet Union itself or parts of contiguous Asia. And so we built up stockpiles so that our military machine and our industrial machines would not grind to a halt quickly if there were a war. That stockpile has been dismantled by about 93%. It's now worth $1 billion. Now you might say part of this is because we have more supply, we've got places in southern Africa we can access, we've got, you know, Australia has a lot of minerals, they're on our side. And it's true that we do have some backup concepts here, but we really have to update the way of thinking, not just for ourselves, but our allies. What about Japan and South Korea? If there's a strategy of economic warfare, how long can Japan and South Korea survive that? And if they can't, then how long can we really propose this as the centerpiece of an allied response? So one piece of the economic warfare strategy that I'm proposing is that we start thinking now about how to rebuild some of these national defense stockpiles. Not a very sexy idea. It almost seems slightly confrontational, but you can do it quietly. You don't have to make a big deal out of it. You know, you add a few hundred million dollars each year worth of stuff. It just gets put off in some quiet corner of some a hearing room that probably even C-SPAN's not going to cover, and, um, and, and no one's going to really know, and, uh, but over time we'll be, we'll be stronger, and we got to get our allies thinking this way too. So that's piece number one. Piece number two is to really develop a mental map of the nature of the global economy and where Russia and China have their greatest vulnerabilities too. And that mental map, I'm not going to you know, I'm not a good enough economist to spend a lot of your time trying to uh, give my interpretation of how to think about flows in the global economy. But there's something in the general range of 20 trillion a year in trade around the world. And a lot of it is within the EU or within the broader ASEAN, uh, East Asian bloc, or here in the NAFTA zone. And then there's about five, six, seven billion a year that crosses those zones. Five, excuse me, five, six, seven trillion a year that crosses those zones. And it involves these global supply chains we all read about. And you know what? China has a heck of a lot of vulnerability still. Ch China's nowhere near a self-reliant uh, sort of balanced economy. They still import most of their electronics from abroad, assemble them in China. They still import most of their energy. They import half their food. There are a lot of ways we can put pressure on China if we need to. With Russia, their primary dependence, they, they sort of in some ways do have more autonomy and autarky than, than China, partly because their economy's you know, been going backward and also partly because they're more of a huge agrarian-based economy and they've got uh, an ability to subs subsistence farm to the extent they need to in a number of areas. But of course, Russia is not really going to want to be a subsistence farming state and they do depend on export of oil and gas and a few other strategic minerals to Europe in particular for a lot of their revenue. So now that we have this very rough mental map of how the global economy works, if we want to think about how to put more pressure on Russia and China in a, in a war scenario than they can withstand, and more pressure on them than they can put on us if they retaliate economically, now we're starting to look like we have a pretty good opportunity. And so the last piece of the, and again, I'm speaking obviously at a broad level of generality here, just to put the concept before you and look forward to your reactions and not suggest that I've done a detailed analysis that would apply to each and every scenario. But the last piece of it is to think more, uh, sort of more rigorously about the use of sanctions and to recognize that we've developed now four or five different categories of sanctions. And we want to be very explicit and strategic about how we apply those in the event of one of these scenarios. So one type of sanction is what Donald Trump's doing to China right now, across the board tariffs, which are really just designed to throw some sand into the gears. Donald Trump's doing it for other reasons, primarily for economic reasons, and he's trying to do a deal. And by the way, even though I'm not a Trump supporter, I do have some time for him on this issue uh, because I think that the inequality in the U.S.-China economic relationship is something that strategists and economists and businessmen and women of both parties have been increasingly worried about for the last 10 to 20 years. And we do need some new tactics. Whether Trump has all the right ones or not, I'm not sure. But I think his willingness to get a little tougher with China is appropriate. 
and is something that even President Obama had said we were going to have to do more of uh, during various parts of his time in office. But the broad tariffs are sort of like throwing sand into the gears of the overall economic interaction. And maybe if you can, if you understand their effects well enough, you can maybe bring a country's growth rate down by some relatively predictable amount. Now, that tends to change over time. Countries adapt. Uh, tariffs don't work the same way indefinitely. But that's a, that's, that's a tool, broad-based tariffs. Another tool, as we've been watching with some of the specific sanctions coming from the Magnitsky Act, coming from the way we've targeted people in the Iranian uh, nuclear and missile programs, is to go after very specific people and companies, to use our intelligence to figure out who is involved in illicit nuclear proliferation, or who was involved in some assassination, or who was involved in uh, building weapons for the Russian military that then were used to seize Crimea, or who is involved um, in some other particular area of activity that concerns us, and then just hit them directly. And especially if they don't see it coming, this can sometimes be pretty effective because their assets are often overseas. Of course, this is the area where Donald Trump was upset with President Obama because Obama did the Iran deal and liberated a lot of the Iranian money that had previously been sanctioned or held in overseas establishments where Iran could not get its hands on that money. And Trump basically said we gave away way too much and we got way too little. But the interesting thing for my argument is not to go back to the Iran debate, it's just to observe that we have learned now how to do this. So targeting individuals and companies is a second category. A third category is to go after areas of technology where we don't want to help the other country catch up to us or advance its own industrial, scientific, and military potential any faster. And obviously, there are some overlaps in some of these categories. But I think conceptually, it's useful to break them down in this way. And so you might think that if China seizes a Senkaku Island or uh, Russia seizes a town in eastern Estonia or Latvia, that in the end, we're going to want to um, put some sanctions on that we're prepared to lift if they come back into good behavior and leave. But there may be other sanctions that we decide to keep because now we've recognized that country is more of a threat than we previously had ascertained. And we really need to slow down their economic and military advancement over the longer term. So that's where the high technology sectoral sanctions could come in. And of course, we've had some of these over the years on China in particular. Even as we've engaged with them a lot economically, there have been certain high-tech areas that we've withheld uh, our best stuff. Over time, the Chinese have been catching up, so this tactic doesn't work as well in all sectors as it used to, but it's still important. With the Russians, for example, we don't like to sell them a lot of high-tech oil uh, drilling equipment trying to slow down the development of their long-term oil economy. So there are ways you can think about that. And then, of course, there are financial sanctions where and these could overlap with the sanctions I talked about a few minutes ago on the individuals and companies and asset freezes and that kind of thing. But you can also impede people from accessing the international banking system for purposes of commerce and trade, the SWIFT system, for example, because so much of the world economy still functions in terms of dollars. That may not be true forever. And if we use these kinds of sanctions too much, people will look for workarounds. So maybe we need to be a little bit less quick to use these sorts of sanctions for the latest you know, relatively minor issue um, in Syria or Afghanistan or something and save them for when we really need them a little bit more. But I would propose that category of, of sanctions as well. And when you put it all together, therefore, let me summarize by saying the following. If we wake up one day and China has taken a Senkaku Island, and I'll, I'll return to the poster child scenario, even though I'm equally interested about Russia in this book and equally concerned about why Russia might do this. And I will say one more word on that in closing, too. But if we now imagine we wake up one day and there are 150 Chinese soldiers on a Senkaku Island, and maybe they even in invented some beautiful excuse for why they're there. Maybe there were Chinese Girl Scouts on the island that day that needed protection because there was a typhoon that blew in, just by happenstance. Um, and then the Girl Scouts got evacuated, but the Chinese troops stayed uh, just to you know, make sure it wouldn't happen again, build a little facility for future ecology trips that got stranded or something, whatever their pretext. Let's say that they're there. And they might tell us they're going to leave soon, but they don't promise when and they don't actually leave. So what do we do? So 
what I'm suggesting is we, we talk down Japanese friends who might want to have it out with the Chinese right there by firing the first shot. I don't want to do that. And instead, we redirect half the Navy instead of the smaller fraction that's generally there, or half the deployable ships of the moment, towards the Western Pacific. With the Japanese, we put U.S. infantry soldiers on all the other Senkaku Islands, and probably now in much of the Ryukyu Island chain as well. That's where Okinawa is found. And any other small islands that we think could be next in line to fall if this Chinese uh, tendency is allowed to continue. Then we indicate to China that we have other, I, other intentions, other ideas that we're not going to talk about yet, but some of them involve potential military responses in other theaters, and leave it at that. That's where my Middle East uh, ideas come into play. And then finally, we think of the right level of economic warfare. And I would probably create a two-tier strategy where one tier is designed to bring down Chinese GDP by several times more than they could possibly benefit from holding one of these Senkaku Islands. So let's find some way to calculate, even if it's partly notional and contrived, the value of a Senkaku Island. Let's say it's the fishing grounds. Whatever we think the Chinese could value those fishing grounds to be worth, let's try to make them pay a price 10 times higher in terms of sanctions. By the way, those sanctions might cost us too. But remember, I'm not, I'm not pretending this is a happy scenario. This is a scenario where the alternative is either to do nothing and invite potential future Chinese aggression or to risk great power war with another nuclear weapon state. So we're not in a happy place. So I'm not going to promise you zero harm to the American economy. I'm not up here to say that let's find sanctions that are so clever that they really suck it to China and don't affect the American consumer or businessman at all. This might hurt everybody. But what I want is a kind of sanctions regime and an economic warfare strategy where we are resilient against the likely Chinese response. We sort of have escalation dominance, if you want to use nuclear lingo from the Cold War, from the Schelling and Herman Kahn days and Bernard Brody and the like. And, and so I would want to calculate, to the extent possible, some notional value for these islands, and then tell China, we are applying the following instruments of economic warfare, which we will sustain as long as you are still occupying that island. Now, maybe you have quiet diplomacy to see if there's some way to resolve this and give the Chinese a little bit of face saving. That wasn't really my purpose in this book, to propose what that diplomacy should be. I wanted to construct the alternative to a military uh, invasion or assault, and one that would be an instrument of warfare, and it would require the different elements of the U.S. government to help design in advance, ideally, and not just leave it to the National Security Council to design when the crisis happens. By the way, quick uh, asterisk, we always say the NSC's gotten too big, because now it has 400 people, but we always leave scenarios like this to the NSC, <laughs> and we assume they'll just work it out once we, once we have the problem. So uh, for those of you who aren't NSC junkies and may not have quite follow what I was trying to argue. You know, back from the in, the, in the early days when the National Security Council, that White House team to advise the president was formed decades ago, they had a few dozen people at most, actually even less. And then it grew to low hundreds, now it's up to about 400. And that's the place at which military planning and economic sanctions planning intersect and come together in the U.S. government. They really don't come together any other place that I'm aware of. And I'm suggesting we need to change that. But back to my uh, Senkaku response, in addition to the sanctions that would be calibrated to try to, try to create you know, 10 times the pain, I think we would also then want to think about a longer term strategy for slowing China's economic rise. And it might slow our economy too. But particularly in high tech sectors, there may be certain things we want to do that we would not lift even once China goes back to good behavior. And again, you want to announce this in advance, and maybe those shouldn't be huge just for the Senkaku Islands. I also talk about Taiwan scenarios in this book, where China attacks Taiwan, maybe a blockade, maybe cyber and missile strikes, maybe not a complete effort to overrun and invade and annex the place, but you know, coercive uses of military power. If you start seeing a scenario like that, then we probably have to go bigger. We have to be tougher. We have to be even more. Uh, proportionate, even, even at a higher level in our response. But for, for a Senkaku Island, you may not put on a lot of long-term sanctions. 
but you might want to indicate to China, you know, we thought you were a friend. <laughs> Actually, for the last 10 years, we were starting to doubt it, but, but we, 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 would, we, we were hoping to believe it. You've pretty much revealed you're not. And it's going to take a while to get back to where we were before. It's going to take more than just an apology and pulling your troops off the island. That will be enough to lift the general sanctions. But some of these specific high-tech sectoral sanctions will remain because now we realize that you really are a competitor, even more than we thought before, a strategic competitor in military and national security terms. And I think that's the strategy. Now, people would say, maybe some of you think this adds up to a weak strategy, that it's appeasing aggression or that it's inviting aggression. I don't want to say this should be the only strategy. I don't want to signal Beijing and Moscow in advance this would be the only strategy. So I don't want to invite aggression through weakening our potential for a, a military response. We should still have that option. But I just think if deterrence fails, in the first instance, we shouldn't really use it. And um, finally, let me, if, if that scenario didn't fully persuade you, let me finish on the Russia note and, and lo looking forward to the uh, Angela Stent um, speech as well. She'll be great. I've read the book and it's very good. But you might say, well, you know, this scenario seems a little contrived. Yeah, the Chinese are harassing the Japanese around the Senkakus, but the Chinese are too interested in trade and commerce uh, to really do this, to really do anything violent. And if they were going to, they would have by now. Um, you might feel that way. You might be right. I can't prove it. I'm, I'm worried enough about these scenarios that I wanted to write a book about how to respond if they happen. I'm not suggesting you should lose sleep about it tonight. Better to lose sleep about the Orioles losing to the Yankees tonight. <laughs> but, 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 you know, if there's even a 5% probability of this happening, that's uncomfortable when the adversaries each have nuclear weapons. But with Putin, here's what I worry about with Russia. I think the Chinese want to gradually become the other superpower, and they want the world to have more of their stamp. They want more of Asia to recognize them as the great middle kingdom. I'm not really sure, however, they really feel the need to overturn the existing international order to do that. But I think there's a part of Vladimir Putin's mind that really would like to destroy NATO. I mean, I think he hates it to his core. And whatever he hate, however much he hated it before, when we added 13 new members after the Cold War and brought in former Soviet republics, I think he hates it now even more than previously. And uh, I've also written about this topic, and I, I actually think we expanded NATO too far. But what's done is done. We have to protect the 29. I don't want to take any more, by the way. But um, I think we have to protect the 29. But Putin would love to find a scenario where with limited risk, he can cause NATO to have a debate about its very purpose. Because imagine what our reaction as an alliance would be. Everybody from Germany to Poland to Greece to France to Britain, Canada, 20 some other, Turkey, Hungary. Uh, imagine what the conversation is going to be like the day after Putin, perhaps without firing a shot, puts his little green men into eastern Estonia. Now, the Estonian military might respond, whether we like it or not. They would have every right to do so. It's an aggression on their territory. But do they really want to pick that fight when they've only got five, 6,000 soldiers in their entire military, and Putin's you know, announced an exercise right over the border inside of Russia that involves 40,000? Bless you. Uh, do the Estonians really want to be the ones to fire the first shot themselves? I don't know what they would do. Frankly, they're pretty damn tough. They might fire the first shot. And, and I think we would have to have their back if they did. But I think if, if there's just a Russian uh, seizure of that town, imagine the debate the next day in Brussels. The 29 are not going to come together in unanimity on this and what to do about it, in my expectation or prediction. Because a lot of countries, all countries, want to avoid war with Russia. A lot of them certainly think they should still want to avoid, and we should still want to avoid war with Russia, even after Russia aggressing against a NATO member. Some will doubt whether we should have brought the Baltic states into NATO in the first place, since they were part of the Soviet Union, although that was against their will. So I'm not suggesting the, the Russian claim here is valid. But I am suggesting that some NATO members will revisit why they got duped into supporting the expansion of NATO that far east in the first place. And others sort of have favorable relationships with Putin, like some of the countries we were mentioning a minute ago. Uh, and so NATO, I think, could be paralyzed about how to respond. 
Now, some subset of NATO countries led by us might decide, might decide to respond militarily anyway, even without formal alliance blessing, and then say to the rest of the alliance, this is a moment of truth. There's no choice but to respond. And anybody who doesn't come and honor their Article 5 mutual defense pledge to each other, uh, after the war, there's going to be some scores to settle. That might be our ad attitude. But I'm not sure that's Donald Trump's instinct. Uh, and I mean, he's actually openly questioned some of our commitments to some of the new members. And moreover, NATO's supposed to make decisions by consensus. So I wouldn't be surprised if Putin would see an opportunity here to leave us divided. And then let's say, you know, we avoid all out war, but it still sort of ends badly. Russia stays in control of this town for a long time. NATO seems unserious about its Article 5 mutual defense commitments to each other. And then we have an existential crisis in the alliance about why are we even still allies? The conversation that President Trump seems to want to have every other day, even now. But most of the rest of us don't. But maybe we do after this moment, when NATO has failed to come to the defense of one of its new members. For Putin, this is a dream. What he wants is to see NATO crumble away, because he sees it as a vestige of the Cold War, and it prevents Russia from playing equally in a great power game. As long as we have, by the way, you should check this out, NATO is half of world GDP, it's, and more than half of world military spending. It's stunning just how much power there is in NATO. We always tend to focus on our weaknesses. We can't agree, you know, we got these new members that are hard to defend. Burden sharing on the military side is inadequate. But the 29 members of NATO are more than half of world GDP, and, and more than half, or no, I'm sorry, almost half of world GDP, more than half of world military spending. So, and that's not even counting Japan, Korea, Australia, not even counting our security partners in the broader Middle East, not even counting India, which is probably more friend uh, than nemesis to us and more nemesis than friend to China at this juncture. We have a pretty strong position overall, but Putin would love to weaken that. So I actually think Putin might be contemplating these kind of scenarios. And even if Putin is not, what about his successor? Here's what I really fear in the case of Russia, and this will be my last thought. What I really fear is um, a, a guy like Putin who has the same worldview, the same sense of history, the same anger, the same bitterness, but isn't as smart and makes the wrong calculations. Every calculation Putin's made, he's sort of gotten away with it at one level. I mean, for the long-term good of Russia, it's been a mistake because the sanctions that the EU has placed on in response to aggression against Ukraine have held back Russia's economic development, hasn't made Russia a better place to live. But he's sort of gotten away with these things in a military sense, in a sort of grand geopolitic sense, in a game of risk sense. And that's the game he likes to play. So he f waits for his opportunities, he chooses them carefully, and he's careful. He's a brute, he's a thug, but he, in his own way, he's not stupid, and he follows a pretty careful calculus before he acts. The next guy might not be so smart. And then what happens when Putin's successor carries out the scenario against Estonia or Latvia that I just laid out? So with that, uh, thank you for your patience. I look forward to your reactions and your, and your comments. We thank you very much. It's been really, really very interesting. Uh, I'll repeat your questions, and then he'll answer your real question. Sir, the question is, uh, is not uh, China's behavior in the South China Sea an example of the very thing you're talking about? It's a great question. As you know, in the South China Sea, the only treaty ally that we have is the Philippines, and that's not exactly an alliance in good standing at the moment. But. Um, that's where I do talk about those kinds of scenarios, which I think are quite akin. If there's, a, if there's an island that's close to the Philippines, or a place like the Scarborough Shoal, which is within its economic zone, and then China aggresses against the Philippines, I think it raises all the same kinds of questions. So I would apply a similar calculus. If Chinese behavior towards the Scarborough Shoal area intensifies, then I think we should start with this set of responses that involve an economic warfare philosophy, but also potentially some military deployments in the area. You know, with President Duterte, not really sure whose side he's on. 
It's a little more complicated. I'm not really interested in forcing the issue. So China would have to raise it to a new level for me to want to worry about a response right now. But also, as you know, the uninhabited islands, the reclaimed islands in the South China Sea are primarily contested or in a space that's contested by Vietnam, Brunei, Malaysia, countries that we are not allied with formally. And in that situation, I'm not interested even in a, uh, necessarily applying the current strategy that I just laid out unless um, it involves the Philippines or Thailand, unless it starts to involve ships of allied countries, or unless the Chinese really start to enforce their claim that this is essentially their waterway and prevent ships from coming through. In fact, if that happens, I think it's at an even higher level of seriousness than the Senkaku Islands, and we actually do have to fight over that. I think sea lanes in open waters are not something where we necessarily uh, offer a non-military response in the first instance. Um, and then finally, uh, I do think that um, in regard to these islands, if the Chinese simply just keep adding more airfields and airstrips and fighters and so forth, if and when we improve our relationship further with the Philippines or with Vietnam, that we should think about more U.S. military bases in the region and think about a rough sort of matching strategy. And at the moment, I'd be prepared to say to China, listen, if you, if you would cut it out and keep things at the current level, you won't be happy that we're still going to sail aircraft carriers through. We won't be happy that you got fighter jets in an area that President Xi promised to President Obama he would not militarize and has blatantly gone against his own word. But we can live with something that looks like parity. But if you insist on an arms race to establish superiority, we're going to have to respond. So those would be some of the elements I would use. What should be our strategy toward Venezuela? I just wrote a, a, a short piece on Venezuela. I've been trying very hard to avoid that question. Uh, <laughs> not just tonight, but for a long time. But I had a very good colleague, very smart colleague at Brookings, a Colombian woman, woman who, a Colombian American who had worked at USAID during the Obama administration and watched the situation deteriorate for many years inside of Venezuela. And even before President Trump put the much tighter sanctions on imports of Venezuelan oil, the, as you know, the economy was already going through the floor and healthcare system, et cetera. President Trump is rolling the dice because he's decided to force the issue. He's decided to drive the Venezuelan economy even further down, hoping he could get a kind of a response, sort of like what happened in the Philippines in the 80s when we persuaded Marcos to leave after he had stolen an election. You know, sometimes that strategy works even without an invasion, but usually it doesn't. I don't want to invade Venezuela. But what she and I, the scholar and I, uh, came up with, in, we think that there might be a need eventually, if things keep getting a lot worse, to create a militarily protected safe zone inside of Venezuela, but not in the main cities. Uh, essentially an internal refuge for internal refugees, IDPs. Uh, because if we keep contributing to the further deterioration of Venezuelans' access to access food, access to food and medicine, I don't know that we can morally sustain that indefinitely. And if our strategy of brinkmanship doesn't get Maduro to blink, then I think we're left with the options of, of something like what I just said or of relenting. And I'm not sure the relenting part is a very good strategy either. So that's as far as my thinking has gotten so far on that question. Dr. O'Hanlon's quite willing to sign copies of his book right outside of the door on the left-hand side. And uh, <laughs> let me, and let me uh, again thank him for all of us. Yeah.